Is it good to have Pastor back? It's great to have Pastor back, right? Awesome. Go ahead and be seated. God bless you all. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, everybody. Amazing. Going to get right into the Word. If you have your Bible, which is important to have as a Christian, hallelujah, John 16, 5 through 7 is where we're going to go. I'm going to read the Scripture. I'm going to tell you why this message and Sunday's message, this is going to be part one. I'm going to give you part two on Sunday for those of us who are a hallmark. John 16, 5 through 7, I'm going to say why this is one of the most important messages you can have in this time. This is Jesus speaking, but now I am going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. Tonight, I'm going to speak on, do you know who you have access to? I'm going to speak on who he is. But Sunday, for those of us who are at Hallmark, if you're at Pomona, go to that church. <laughs> I'm going to speak on how he leads you. Because let me tell you why this is so important, this message. If you don't understand what's going on in our time right now, what happens in Israel, as goes Israel, so goes the church. Israel is a place you got to keep your eyes on. It's just one of the things, but you understand there's 2,500 prophecies that are in the Bible, 2,500. 2,000 of them, over 2,000 now, have already been fulfilled. Fulfilled prophecy is the number one way that you can prove that the Bible is true. If you look at the book of Islam, if you look at, uh, if you look at any of the Quran, any other books, you will not find prophecies. There's no prophecies that need to be revealed. Only the Bible has prophecy. And over 2,000 of those prophecies have already been fulfilled. Now understand, Jesus himself, there was over 300 prophecies about Jesus. Jesus fulfilled every single one of those prophecies while he was alive. Now, like I said, one of the greatest proofs that your Bible is true is the fulfillment of prophecy. But there's also archaeological evidence. Every single month, they're constantly finding exactly what the Bible says. They're finding it under the ground. They're finding the, the money. They're finding the temples. They're finding Sodom and Gomorrah. They're finding the place where Noah's Ark was at. It's constantly archaeological evidence. But then one of the greatest evidences is the fact that lives are being changed for those who believe in this message. One of the greatest evidences that you need is that your life was shifted when Jesus came into your life. But I want you to know, if you do not know how to be led by the Holy Ghost, you have to understand, when you get up to the judgment seat, you're not going to be there with your family. You're not going to be in front of the judgment seat with your husband or your wife. You're not going to be there with your children. You will be there alone in front of God. And God is going to show and ask you to give an account. Now, remember, there are two judgment seats in the Bible. There's the great white throne judgment. That is the judgment seat where sinners who have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior will be judged for every sin they have committed. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have believed on him, if you have received him, repented of your sins, you will not be judged for those sins when you get to the judgment seat because the blood of Jesus has washed away every single one of your sins. But there is a second, there's a second judgment seat. This is for Christians, believers. You will be judged not on if you receive Jesus, but how you lived your life as a believer. Psalm 139 says this. You knew me before I was even formed in my mother's womb. You've numbered every hair on my head. You've written down every single one of my days in your book. Now, most people can think that book is just like, hey, we get to heaven. You know, we made some mistakes. We did some good stuff. We get to heaven, and then all of a sudden, whatever ended up happening, God's like, look, it was all in my book. That's not that. That book has your life if you live according to God's will, 
That book is your purpose. That book is what God has destined for you. But if you don't know how to be led by the Holy Ghost, you will arrive with your own book. God will show his book for your life. And everything that was not in his book is burned in the fire. The Holy Spirit, knowing him, understanding how to be led by him, is whether or not you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant when you get to heaven. If you don't know how to be led by him, you're not going to hear it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5 that many people will get to the throne and actually suffer loss. Christians who lived on earth, it said that they will escape as if one escaping barely through the flames. They'll get into heaven, but they literally will have no rewards to show for anything they did in life. Because they were not led by the Holy Ghost. You see, Romans 8, 14 says this. Those who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Now, that word sons means this. The mature sons of God. The tense is maturity. You do not have more maturity because you've been sitting in church longer than I have. You are not automatically more mature as a leader or a Christian because you are older than me. Now, you might be more mature about life, but you're not more mature about things in the Spirit because the only way you mature in the Spirit is by being led by the Holy Ghost. You see, listen, you could be, you could be in church for 30 years but not be leadable because you still want to be the Lord of your own life and therefore, you are still a baby in the spirit. Paul says that there is milk, there's meat, there's strong meat. He said there's a maturity that has to take place. There's something that this is an evolving process. But as you're led by the spirit, you mature. You're growing older. Even though you might not look older in the physical, your spirit's maturing. That's why you can have teenagers who just got saved two years ago, but are fully surrendered to the Holy Ghost, doing more for God... Because God is not looking for you to present your education. God does not need you to look prim and proper. God is not looking for you to offer him anything. You have nothing you can offer God that he does not already have. What he wants is your surrender. He wants you to say, God, what do you want? God, what do you want with my time? God, what's going to happen? You, listen, the Bible says this. This is so powerful, 2 Corinthians. It says that the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisest of man's ideas. Please understand what he's saying. Your greatest idea is God's stupidest. He says the weakness of God, Paul says, is stronger than the greatest of human strength. The weakest God can get is still not weak enough to get as strong as you could ever get. Do you really think you can do this life without him? Do you know it's impossible to fulfill what God wants for your life without the help of the Holy Ghost? You see, God is so good to us. I was talking before the service to Larry. He's a great friend of mine. Everybody should know Larry. If you don't, you're missing out. <laughs> Larry and I were in the back, and we were talking, and we were talking about the power of praying in the Holy Ghost. And I said, Larry... And he's like, it's kind of crazy, though. Like, when you pray in the Holy Ghost, it's kind of crazy. Like, it's just crazy what God gave us. I, I said, I know. God gave us a cheat move. I said, what do you mean? He literally lets us cheat. He gives us God, and he allows God to use our mouth to pray to God, and we get the benefit. I mean, that's kind of like cheating. I mean, every time you pray in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is using your mouth to mouth the words, yet you are praying a perfect prayer. And every perfect prayer gets a perfect answer. So all day long, you don't even know what you're saying, but as you're letting it out of your spirit, John 7, 37, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. As you're letting it out of your spirit, what's going on is answers are coming to your family. Answers are coming to your body. Answers, protection is coming around your home. It's, it's kind of unfair. You see, for a Christian who understands the power of prayer and being led by the Holy Ghost, it is unfair for the devil every day you wake up, he hates you. He just is like, dang it, it's a losing battle. They woke up today. Oh, God. You see, the Bible simply says, James 4, resist the devil, submit yourself to God, resist the devil and he will flee. You see, there might be a lot of warfare going on. I understand. But Christians are too obsessed with warfare. 
They're too obsessed. We need to know what spiritual warfare is, yes. But I just want to tell you, the fact that you're constantly talking about the warfare in your life means you don't know how to be led by the Holy Ghost. Because let me tell you what happens. When you're led by the Spirit of God, Psalm 23 verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down by green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. So this is what happens. When you start getting in sync, Galatians chapter 5, walk in step with the Spirit. That means walk in the rhythm. Get into the beat with the Holy Ghost. When you begin to walk in the rhythm, you wake up in rhythm. You go to lunch in rhythm. You go to sleep in rhythm. So what begins to happen is you begin to get favor when you're here. When you're here. When you're here. You're favor when you lie down. You got favor when you get up. You got favor when you meet that conversation. So what's going on? Ecclesiastes, listen. Listen. Ecclesiastes says this. I, I didn't have any of this planned, but I'm just flowing right now. Ecclesiastes says this. It says that God, this is so powerful, if you will understand, he says, those who will serve God and enjoy the things he's given them, he said, God will make you so occupied with enjoying life that you will not have time to see the warfare. <laughs> now listen, I didn't say that warfare isn't coming. I didn't say, you see, the Bible says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Listen. Weapons will be formed. Weapons will be formed. They just simply will bounce off and not work. So please, I want to talk to you on Sunday about being led, but I want to talk to you about who he is. Jesus is in front of the disciples. Please listen to what happens. He's talking to these men he's walked with for the last three and a half years. And he says something that does not make them happy, but makes them very sad. I have to go away. Now, Jesus is looking there, and he's like, but it's better for you that I go away. And they're looking at each other. Can you imagine being one of the disciples? Looking, what is he? He's saying he's going away. That already is killing us here. The Bible says that when they heard that they could not go to where he goes, it said that they became distraught and pierced at the heart. They've been following him for three and a half years. They went everywhere he went. They slept where he slept. They ate where he ate. And all of a sudden, they can't go where he's going. They're sad. So he looks at him and says, but it's better for you because I'm sending this person. And by that time, their ears were muted. They didn't hear anything else. It said Jesus was looking and said, you aren't even asking me about where I'm going. You're not asking me about nothing. You're just sad. Let me just imagine you're Peter. Um, Jesus, yeah, I'm sad. Um, I was there the day that I was nothing. I was fishing for some fish. My life, I didn't know where it was going. I didn't know what was happening. But you came walking down the beach. And you saw someone who nobody else saw. You saw me. And you called me out. And you said, come follow me. You gave me a chance when nobody else gave me a chance. Yeah, there's nobody better than you, God. Jesus, I was there the moment that you came out. And I'd been trying to fish all night. And I couldn't catch any fish. Matter of fact, none of us caught anything. We had boats out there all night. I'm a professional fisherman, and I couldn't figure it out. You come out, and you get on my boat, and you said, cast out your nets. You didn't say cast out a net. Nets, plural, because Jesus knew what was about to happen. He didn't know what was going to happen, but he said, with a catch you're about to get, you're going to need many nets. Many. I do exceedingly above and beyond. Oh, you could ask or think. He said, in Jesus, I was on the boat. I was there when you said, Cast out your nets. And I said, at your word. Because Jesus, there was something about when you spoke. I was tired. I wanted to go home. I'd been fishing all night. But when you spoke, at your word, we cast out the nets. And I, my gosh, God, you were there. And we had so many nets that were there. My boat began to sink. My boat began to sink. You know why? Because Jesus, when he speaks, he was there at the beginning when it said, let there be water. Let there be fish. And when that mouth spoke, what happened was this. Every fish in that lake, every fish in the Indian Ocean, every fish in the Pacific Ocean, every fish in the Atlantic Sea was headed for that net because Jesus had spoken every fish. Those fish just happened to be the first ones who got there. The whales were headed to it. The sharks were headed to it. They're about to catch some stuff because the one who tuned the water. 
He said, I was there, Jesus. There's nobody better than you. Can you imagine? Peter said, I was there. I was there when we were freaking out and you were napping. You're napping. We're there freaking out. We're thinking we're going to die. And finally, one of us said, get up, Jesus. Don't you care about us? And you stood up, Jesus. And I saw you walk to the front of our boat, put your foot on the thing. And you talked to the waves and you talked to the clouds like they were a person. And you said, I want you to be quiet. Peace, be still. And Lord, when you spoke, the winds calmed down and the waves bowed to you. I was there. There's nobody like you, Jesus. I was there when we were in the midst of a storm. It was 3 a.m. in the morning. We thought we were going to die. And you come out walking on the stuff I drowned in. I was there. I was there, Jesus. When you said, I said, man, if that's you, God, you got to call me out. Because I know who you are. And you said, come. And I thought, my God, I'm about to walk on something I've drowned in. But I was going to step out. Because I know if you said it. You see, what happened was when Jesus said, come, Peter didn't walk out on the water. Peter walked out on a word. He walked out on come. And what happened was the moment he said it, he walks out and the H2O molecules began to speak to each other. That molecule said, listen, hey, 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 he said we got to come. He's about to step on us. That water molecule looked at that one. H hydrogen looked at oxygen. They looked together and said, you got to get together. You got to get together because he's about to, oh. I was there. There's nobody like you, Jesus. I was there when I promised that I would never deny you. And you looked at me and you said, before the crow, three times, you're going to deny me. And I thought you were crazy because I would do anything to follow you, but you were right. I betrayed you. I let you down. But Jesus, when I saw you again, I was there when you looked at me and you said, do you love me? Feed my sheep, do you love me? Feed my sheep, do you love me? Feed my sheep, you know why Jesus? Because I found out that day, you never build a monument to my failures. You always talk about my future and my potential. Jesus is not building a monument to your failures. He's not building a monument to your past. He's already talking about your future. I was there, Jesus. Can you imagine being John? Man, I was there at a wedding, Jesus. Can I say something real quick, Peter? Sit down. I was there at a wedding, Jesus, and we were all out of wine, and your mama came over and said, you got to do something about it, and you try to argue with your mama, and it didn't work because mamas always win. So he there, and he said, hey, you got to help him. And all of a sudden, you got these men, and they put some jars in water. It wasn't wine. It was water. And they took the water, and you told the men to take the water and take it to the head of the, the, the wedding. And I thought you were crazy, Jesus, because they didn't need water. They needed wine. But I watched them, and every step that they took, something began to happen to the water in that cup. Because remember how faith works. You get the word, and it's not just the word that causes the water to turn to wine. The miracle you need is caused by steps of faith that believe and act on the word. You see, it was from here, it was water. But their steps of faith begin to transform the water and it turned into wine. See, Jesus, I saw that. Jesus, I was there when you were at the Last Supper. I laid my head on your chest. There's no one like you, Jesus. I was there. If I would write everything down that you did... I would fill up all the books of all the libraries in all of the world. And you're trying to tell me that it's better that you go? Can you see it? Can you see Peter and John? Now watch Jesus. He steps up and he says, I understand. But you weren't there when this happened. They all perked up. I was in the River Jordan. And John the Baptist... Remember that crazy guy who ate grasshoppers? Yeah, 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 yeah. He puts me under the water. I come up out of the water, and the Holy Ghost, ooh, wait till you see him. He came down and descended, and he rested on me. I went out with the Spirit for 40 days into a desert. I defeated the devil. You didn't see it, 
But what happened was when I came back and I turned the water into wine, it wasn't me, it was him. When I walked on the water, it wasn't me, it was him using me. I surrendered to him. When I came up and I spoke to the leprosy to go, it wasn't me, it was the Holy Ghost reaching out. When I was in that tomb and you thought I was dead, it wasn't me, it was the Holy Ghost who brought me up from the dead. He's the one I'm sending to you. You see, Jesus thinks it's better for you and me tonight in San Bernardino that he would not physically be here, but that we would have the Holy Ghost. Why? Why? Because Jesus was limited to a body. If you wanted to meet with Jesus right now, you'd have to get on a plane and fly to Tel Aviv. You'd have to get in a hotel. You'd probably be a couple weeks, maybe months back because by the time you saw Jesus, you'd have to have everything written down. You'd maybe get a minute to two minutes with him, maybe. You'd get in front of him, and if you forgot anything, there's no way you're going to be able to talk to him again because he's still got to sleep. He's got a line waiting with people all over the world that got to speak to him. But the Holy Ghost is right here in San Bernardino. The Holy Ghost is over there at Arrowhead. The Holy Spirit is in L.A. The Holy Spirit is in Texas. The Holy Spirit's in Uganda. The Holy Spirit. You see, this is what he is. The Holy Spirit is Jesus unlimited. The Holy Spirit is Jesus unlimited. He's Jesus. Come on, look to your neighbor and say, Jesus unlimited. Look to the other neighbor. He's Jesus unlimited. So the disciples look at him and they say, Lord, what's he like? John 16, 13 through 15. But when he, the spirit of truth, the truth giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth, the whole full truth. For he will not speak of his own message on his own authority. But he will tell you whatever he hears from the father he will give the message that has been given to him. And the moment he said that, the disciples would have been like, oh, I know that, because that's what you did, Jesus. You never did anything you didn't see the Father do. You never said anything you didn't see the Father say. Yeah, mm, that sounds like you. And he said, he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come and will happen in the future. You see, hear this. If you don't know how to relate and have intimacy with the Holy Ghost, you are going to be left stranded and confused while the world is happening around you. But if you know how to be led by his voice, you will know what's going to happen before it happens. You'll have peace when everybody else is freaking out. You'll know that you're in a place of, you will have peace that passes your understanding. You'll be able to know in the midst of a storm that God is in your boat. You'll be able to see when your child freaks out, you'll say, oh, ha, 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 good try, devil, but I know what the Holy Ghost is doing in my son. You'll look at your butt. <laughs> you'll look at your marriage right now and say you know honey I know it seems bad now but we got the Holy Ghost if we got the Holy Ghost we have hope the moment as long as we have the Holy Spirit we have hope not only do we have hope it's time to get a victory it's time to start fighting against each other it's time to stop looking at you as my enemy and it's time to fight the real enemy baby it's time to get with the Holy Ghost he's wanting to defeat our enemies He's going to, listen, he's going to announce and declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. He gives dreams and visions. You see, for some of y'all, when you sleep, it's one of your most scariest, horrible times. You have anxiety attacks. You have constant nightmares. But you see, the Bible says that sleep belongs to the Lord. The darkness is the same as the light to God. It's so crazy how the world makes us fear the dark. God created the dark so we could see the stars. God created the dark so we could have a good sleep. God created the dark because there's animals and things that flourish in the darkness that can come out in the light. It's the same thing as the light to God. There's no difference. That's culture. That's the enemy trying to tell you something is wrong. But I want to tell you this. God gives love letters while you sleep. They're called dreams. They're called visions. I know people who get healed, physically healed, in a dream. Wake up, they're all better. 
I know people who get deliverance in dreams. They are in the dream. Jesus comes to them in the dream, delivers them. They're all better. Why? Because these people have known that the devil no longer has a right to my sleep. He has, doesn't have a right to what I'm doing. He can't get in my dreams. God will give you visions. You'll be about to get on a plane, but because you know the Holy Ghost will say, ah, wait a second, something's going on. You'll be about to travel to a, a different country and God will say, you don't need to go there. You'll be about to say something to a person and you'll feel in your spirit, don't say that, say this. And what's going to happen is, here's the deal, we don't praise God enough for all the closed doors. We're only praising God for the open doors. This is what's very important. God is rescuing you. And for those of you who know how to be led by the Holy Ghost, the only reason the door didn't open is because God doesn't want you to settle for something that is not his best. you got to accept this. You have to accept this. You broke up with that boy because that guy is not good for you. God is not going to let you mess up your life by being in that relationship. He's not going to let you mess up your marriage. He's not going to let you mess up your ministry. Listen, he will honor and glorify me. This is Jesus talking. Because he will take and receive, draw from what is mine. He's going to reveal. Listen, the Holy Ghost will declare to you the words of Jesus. He'll disclose to you the words of Jesus. And look, he'll transmit to you the power of Jesus. He is just like Jesus. You want to know what the Holy Ghost is like? He's just like Jesus. He speaks like Jesus. He acts like Jesus. He walks like Jesus. Everything the Father has is mine. That is what I meant when I said, He, the Spirit, will take the things that are mine, and He's going to reveal them to you. He is the one who is left here on earth for you. You see, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. He's just as much God as God the Son. He's just as much God as God the Father. He's not less God than the other two. He's just as much God as God the Son. He's just as much God as God the Father. And he is the one who is left with you here on earth. See, the Father is in heaven, the Bible says, on his throne. Jesus is at his right hand, the Bible says, praying for you. He's interceding for you and me. Do you know that because of Jesus' prayers, maybe you haven't cracked yet? Do you know because Jesus is interceding for you, somebody here on earth was agreeing with his prayers? It might have been your grandma. It might have been your mama. It might have been your dad. It might have been your brother. It might have been your sister. But somebody was agreeing with the prayers he was praying. And that's why you're in this building. That's why you got a breakthrough. That's why you are where you are. But the Holy Ghost, he's right here. The Bible says that he makes your home, your temple, his home. Can I ask you a question? The Holy Spirit, just think about this, had the opportunity to get any house he wanted. It's not like he's lacking with resources. Millions, of, think about you. Do you want the millions and millions of dollar home that's on the edge of the cliff, that's over the ocean, that looks gorgeous? Or do you want the shack that's in the back of the house that's all matted up? Again? I mean, that's what my life looked like. But the Holy Ghost looked at you and he said, that's my perfect fixer-upper. That's the one I want. That's the home I want. He looked at your body. He looked at your hands that have committed the sins they have. He looked at your mouth that said the things you wish you could take back. He's looked at your thoughts and your dirty mind. He looked at your feet where they've walked. And he said, that's my perfect house. Thank you, God. You see, he's the one that Jesus left to partner with us. But he is a person. If I could name the amount of times I've heard the Holy Spirit called it. Oh, wow. It was so powerful in the building today. It was so powerful. It wasn't it wasn't powerful. He was so powerful. Oh, oh. the cloud. It was like this cloud. I got these goosebumps. Oh, my gosh. When they sang that song, the goosebumps. <laughs> He's not a goosebump. He's not a drug. He's not a high. He's a person. 
How do I know he's a person? Well, Romans 8, 27 says he has a mind and he thinks for himself. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11 says that he has his own thoughts. Romans 15, 30 says that he can give and he receives and gives love to you from Jesus. The love of God passes through him to you. Ephesians 4, 30 says he can be grieved. Hebrews 10, 29 says he can be insulted. Acts 5, 3 says he can be lied to. Acts 7, 51 says he can be blasphemed and resisted. Matthew 12, 31, he can be blasphemed. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, he makes choices when he decides who he wants to give the gifts to and this gift there and that gift there. Acts 13, 2, he speaks on his own. Romans 8, 26, he speaks on behalf of you when you don't even know what to pray, but he'll pray on your behalf. He's a person. He's a person. Go ahead. He's a person. You see, I did a trek to find out the Holy Ghost. I wanted to know everything about him and how he leads me. So I went through a common book of the Bible called the book of Acts. And I started at the beginning of Acts. And I went through the whole book, all 28 chapters. And do you know, if you take out the supernatural and the Holy Ghost involvement, not one chapter in the entire book of Acts would stay intact. You know why Acts is so important? It's because it's God's revealing of what he wants the church to be. It's what we should be like. Do you know how present the Holy Ghost is with you? Do you know how much he wants to be involved in your personal life? Do you know that he's a person? You can talk to him. He's here right now. You see, in Acts 2, 37 through 38, he was given because he's the promise of God. It says, if you being bad fathers and mothers know how to give gifts to your children, how much more will God the Father want to give you the Holy Ghost? Acts 3, 5 through 7, he's over there with the disciples and it says that they're, they're being tempted not to be bold because they're being threatened for their life. But the Holy Ghost is there with them, making them bold, making them declare the word of the Lord, not scared of what man will say. Acts 4, 8 through 13, 6, 9 through 10, it says that he's in the midst of these people and the disciples are in the midst there and they're trying to be tricked and, and the Pharisees are coming and asking them hard questions, but he was there, the Holy Ghost, giving them wisdom in the midst of them so they would be so wise they were not caught by their tricks. Acts 4, 13 through 14, he's there. And it said he's giving supernatural courage, supernatural knowledge to these men so that they're even confounding the wisest men. You see, the Holy Spirit doesn't need your degree. He needs your surrender. He'll make you smarter than everybody else around you. He'll make you more discerning. He'll give you wisdom. He's there in Acts 4, 19 through 20 making them unafraid of all the dangers and threats. As these men were being beaten, as they were being put in jail, they were unafraid because the Holy Ghost makes you unafraid. He makes you do things even if you're afraid. Can I tell you great, incredible counsel? Do it afraid. Let me say it again. If you want to walk in faith, if you want to be a Christian who does things on this earth and shakes the world, you're going to have to sometimes do it afraid. But know that the Holy Ghost will be there making you bold. It says that he's over in Acts 4.31 causing you to speak the word of God boldly. In Acts 4.32 he's making all the people so generous that nobody was able to have a need that was unmet. It was the Holy Ghost that gives you a generous heart. He makes you want to rescue orphans. He makes you want to rescue widows. He makes you want to bless the poor. It's the Holy Ghost who does that. In Acts 4.33 he's giving them such great power that signs and wonders are following everything they do. In Acts 4.34 he's taking care of every need. For those who are dedicated to his will, because Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God. All of these things are going to be added. You become a magnet of your needs the moment you forget your needs first. And you make God's priority your priority. Acts 5, 3 through 5, he gives words of knowledge. In Acts 5, 11 through 14, he's giving signs and wonders. In Acts 5, 16 through 8, he was there healing people, casting out evil spirits. Do you know the devil's not afraid of you? But when the Holy Ghost comes, when you surrender to his power, 
when you have the words of Jesus in your mouth. They don't want to be around you. They don't want to be around your children. They don't want to be around your house. They don't want to be around your church. They don't want to be around your belongings. Acts 5.29, he's giving them nerve so that they can obey God instead of obeying men. Because the fear of man is a snare. It's a trap. Don't fall into it. Don't be intimidated by your mother. Don't be intimidated by your brother or sister. Because you got to understand, if you got the Holy Ghost, he makes you not able to stop talking about Jesus in Acts 5.42. It said they literally couldn't stop speaking about him. They kept being said, don't talk that name anymore. They said, we can't help it. We rather would obey God than obey you. We're not going to shut up. We got to obey God. (sighs) Acts 7, 55 through 56, 9 and 10, 9 and 12, he gives you open visions. He causes you to have mercy and forgiveness for people who annoy you, for people who gossip about you. You can't forgive them in your own strength, but when the Holy Ghost comes, he gives you the power to forgive even the horrible. Horrible atrocities have been done to you in this building. The Holy Ghost is with you. 829, he gives you specific instructions. In Acts 839, he transports you. He literally can take you from one place and put you in another like he did Philip 55 miles away. He speaks through trances in Acts 10. He anointed Jesus with power in 1038. He raised Jesus from the dead in 1040. He was there in the tomb, y'all. They thought that Jesus was dead, but the Holy Spirit was in the tomb for three days, counting the clock. He was over the body of Jesus. He was over the body of Jesus saying, is it time yet? I can't wait to get you up. Is it time yet? I can't wait to show them what you're about to do. Is it time yet? Jesus was down in hell. Colossians 3 says that he was literally making a mockery of Satan on his home turf. The Bible says in Colossians that Jesus was down in hell. And it said that he literally took all of the principalities and powers. And it said he did a victory dance around Satan's kingdom. It it said that Jesus, it said that Jesus chained up suicide. Jesus chained up depression. Jesus, I can't, Jesus. It said he put him in chains. The Bible said that he was not their slave, but they were his. Can you imagine? He went down to Satan's own field and said, Satan, what are you going to do? Because Satan is the accuser of the brother. But Jesus looked at him and said, what do you have to accuse me of? He walked your sentence. He walked death around hell and laughed at it. He walked depression around hell and he laughed at it. He walked suicide and he said, you're not going to touch my children. You got to understand. He embarrassed every spirit that tries to come against you. Jesus already has embarrassed them. But on that third day, the father looked down and said, the clock ticked ticked it's time and he said Jesus Jesus and that body not through his own power but by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Bible says you do not have a spirit of anyone else but the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives We're talking about the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Ah. 